Assalamu alaikum. And your name is? Ziad Mia. And where are we, Brother Ziad? Uh, we're in the Bosnian Islamic Center in South Ethiopia. And why did we choose to meet here? Uh, I live in this neighborhood and I basically grew up around here and this is the mosque that's basically connected to my family. And your family had something to do with, uh, with this masjid in the past. What was that? Yes, my dad was very active here and he was instrumental in helping to build this physical structure that is the purpose-built mosque. It was a church, Baptist church here before. Uh, that dates back to I think the 1920s. So this spot, you know, was a sacred spot, but uh, we used it as the church as a mosque, and then uh, in the 80s this, this structure was built. And this would be either the third or the fourth, it's debatable by a number of months, the third or the fourth actual masjid location in the city of Toronto, if, if I'm not mistaken. Is that yeah, your understanding that's as my well? understanding. There weren't too many purpose-built mosques uh, or mosques for uh, that sake in those days around uh, so this would have been one of the originals okay. and you often are, are praying here Juma uh, y y right now I am yes because I'm not working downtown when I'm downtown I'm downtown but uh, luckily I'm here this Ramadan right this Ramadan so we met you last Ramadan near the end and uh, we talked a little bit about your project so let's start there what is the name of your project okay. My uh, project is Give30, and uh, basically the main portal is a website, give3030.ca, so G-I-V-E 30.ca. And uh, maybe for some people who are not so familiar with your project or hearing about it for the first time, uh, how did you accidentally, as I understand, come up with this idea? Uh, you know, uh, may, uh, most of us save money, well, all of us save money during Ramadan because we eat uh, food during the day normally, lunch, coffee, donuts, snacks, chocolate, whatever it is, uh, we're not having any of that. So it dawned upon me, it took me a long time, but it dawned upon me that we're actually saving that money uh, by not eating. And uh, the, the principle of Ramadan, one big part of Ramadan is you're going hungry you know, to have spiritual awareness and taqwa, but you're also going hungry to have some empathy with those who don't have enough to eat. And then you're supposed to then turn around and be generous to those people. Uh, so I thought perfect match would be to take that saved money from not eating and move it to fighting hunger. And I thought, you know, food banks are a natural fit. Uh, and that's how I, the idea clicked when I was putting away a coffee cup one Ramadan for the month at work. Uh, and I thought, how do we make this happen? I conceived of the whole idea, but I was a bit of a procrastinator and also used excuses like, I can't uh, make a website and I need to find someone to do, to do that and I couldn't find that person. But you did find these people. I found that person, it was me. <laughs> you know, thank you to the drag and drop website development tools that are out there. Even a guy like me who knows nothing uh, can build a website and uh, basically within weeks launch it. So just on that point, there are people who want to do good works and some ideas and, and that they have. and. What would you tell them in today's technology? I mean, I'm holding up a cell phone, for yep. example, not right, a big yep. camera. Um, I would t encourage anyone with any good idea to try because, you know, there's some probably mangled this cliched saying, but if you don't try, it's 100% failure. But if you do try, you ma you've moved yourself to 50%. So you've, you know, you've increased your odds by 50% of success. So every time you try something, you won't, you know, I can't guarantee you'll succeed, but you're going to have a better chance at it. Um, and so, you know, that there's a famous Harvard book, Getting to Yes, in negotiations. But there's a book by some Canadian authors at York, Getting to Maybe, and they look at social change and they say that increasing those odds, just moving off that couch and trying to move your idea to action is the biggest uh, obstacle in moving to getting to maybe. Now you're at maybe. If you don't do anything, you're at no. But if you move to maybe, then your, your chances change. Um, so I'd say some of the key ingredients are Try to make the idea work, like brainstorm, think about what you need, write it, scratch it down on a piece of paper. Find those people who can help you to do that and network, tap into your networks because that's what I found with this thing. It's mind-boggling the amount of networks and people that I see again that I've run into from other projects. The synergies, it's just phenomenal how, it, how it's all come together uh, to make this thing work. So what were some of the maybes that uh, you initially uh, reached? Uh, 
Uh, so the, the first, the, so the biggest maybe was that website. You know, I convinced myself that I could not do this because I could not get a website. And I had a couple of false starts. I did sit down with a few people, try to do it, and it just wouldn't go. Uh, and in a strange way, maybe it was better that it didn't go when I first had the idea about 12 years ago, because that was before social media and all of these tools that really push uh, your message, and you can start a movement. The Give 30 has become a movement. Uh, you know, you couldn't do with that. With or without you now? With a, it's beyond me. You right. Know? Um, but without these tools, it may have just been a little project that got one little tiny story and then didn't go anywhere because there was no way to have that virality. Um, and unless you, in the, you know, 12 years ago, you probably needed a media budget and sophisticated communications people. Now, here's the media budget in, in a free. Basically, you use Twitter, Facebook, and you hustle for media attention. So the first maybe was finding that website and using those tools. I quickly trained myself on Twitter and Facebook because I did not know how those things worked until about three weeks before Give30 launched. Didn't even have an account on those. But a friend of mine And YouTube, me, you had videos on the f uh, right away. That's right. I mean, I taught myself very quickly because friends of mine, again, I tapped into my networks, people who are good with those things, I asked them to teach me and they taught me how to use those tools. And you improve over time. You know, my first year was probably not the best. Uh, so building that website, drag, drop, built it, then tap into, I realized obviously you need some media attention, earned media as they call it. Uh, so I reached out to CBC's Matt Galloway of Metro Morning, the largest show in Toronto. Matt is a fantastic supporter of great ideas and causes. He was wonderful enough to give me two interviews in 2012 and 2013 that basically jump-started the campaign. Again, once he tweets and puts it on Facebook, these things move, and it moved all around the world, literally. So that was the other maybe. Then, riding my bike to work one day, uh, I'm almost hit by a truck with this other cyclist from my neighborhood out here, out here in Etobicoke. Turns out he works at the Toronto Star, so when I ask him, what does he do there? I almost fell off my bike when he said, city assignment, desk editor. Maybe coincidence, whatever it is, number two. That got me a great story in the star. So those are the two anchors. CBC, Metro Morning, is the largest in-market radio show, and the Toronto Star is the largest circulation newspaper in the country. Those two anchor pieces basically got me free advertising of the message. Uh, and from there, people picked it up, people started spreading it around. Now, they wouldn't have picked it up unless it was a good, unique... I hope so. I mean, I like to think that it's unique. I mean, I hear that from people, that the reason they like it is that it is completely unprecedented and completely unique in, I mean, at least I can say in Canada from my experience, maybe even in the Western world or maybe just broadly. I don't know. I've never, I can't say it's completely because I don't know everything in the world, but from my experience growing up here, we've never seen anything where the Muslim community takes something from its principles, universalizes it, dusts off all the baggage, and offers it to the entire community to unite them. Never seen that before. And that's really what I wanted to build since I was a child. Um, so we're past the maybes now, and that was perhaps the f maybe the first year was one entire maybe. Like yes. Is this going to work? Are we going to hit right. 30 days? And you also didn't end the project after, at the end of Ramadan that first year, if I recall. Yes. What did you decide to do on the fly? I ran it past Ramadan. For some reason I thought, you know, why don't we run it past Ramadan? Some people might find out about it later, or there might be some Eid events. So I ran it into September, in that first year, you know, it was about a month later, it was into September. And I thought, you know, summer holidays ends. If people find out about it, once they come to be more busy, they might want to give. I did see us money keep coming in, and a big jump in donations that got us to almost $40,000. So I thought, why not run it later? I mean, yes, carry the spirit of Ramadan. I mean, all of us know, the Imam tells us, the Imam told us today, that the spirit of Ramadan needs to continue past Ramadan. So I thought, why don't we take that message and say, yes, in Ramadan we should be generous. But hungry people don't stop being hungry. We stop being hungry on, uh, you know, the last day of Ramadan is the last day we're hungry, most of us. But those people we're trying to help don't have a choice not to be hungry. They're hungry on Eid and after that as well. So why don't we push this out further? So this year, 2014, we're running it till September 5th. Uh, so that gives people time afterwards. They can run events related to Eid. If you want to run an event, and I mean now that the fasts are so long in the Northern Hemisphere, if you want to run an event uh, during daytime when you can, everyone can eat, our non-Muslim friends who are supporting, 
and Muslims want to eat during the day, you could hold a daytime event for Yif 30. So when you say events, what um, uh, give us an example. What would one of these events look uh, like or well, uh, from you know, across the country? A w Winnipeg Harvest uh, in, uh, in uh, Winnipeg, the largest food bank there, is my partner in Winnipeg. They ran a phenomenal event this year in this Ramadan just last week, basically called the Fast and Furious Feast. They try to make it fun and entertaining. Uh, and basically, my one of my key ambassadors there is uh, Ibrahim Abi Khan, CFL legend uh, in Winnipeg. He is promoting it. He's he a Muslim CFL, CFL star. football player. That's right. He's retired from football, but he's a commentator and he's well loved in Winnipeg. I think he may be Premier of Manitoba or Winnipeg, so uh, Mayor of Winnipeg someday, and I'll, I'll uh, definitely support him in doing that because he's a wonderful guy, really loves the idea. He has a restaurant called Shawarma Khan in Winnipeg. And so that was the place where they held the Fast and Furious Feast. They closed down the street. They just went crazy. I have a team there that just went crazy on Twitter, advertising in the newspaper, pushing the message out. I, I think we were all thinking we'd get about 50 or 60 people. 200 people showed up. They raised almost $5,000. Uh, it was a fun event. I w had reports from some of my friends. On so this is a, a gathering to break the fast together That's right. at a restaurant? D on the street, basically. The and you closed was too so it was outside? They closed the street. It was in the restaurant, on the street. Uh, all the mayoral candidates showed up. The minister of something or other from Manitoba showed up. Uh, you know, uh, the all sorts of people showed up. Muslims and non-Muslims, it was a 50-50 split, according to my friend at CBC who was there. Uh, he, he reported to me um, that, that he brought his 70-year-old parents and they hadn't really been to a Muslim event before from, from the suburbs of Winnipeg. So for him, he thought that was a great thing. Uh, I just had a discussion yesterday with uh, one of the uh, people at the food bank and the director of development there. And I said, you know, fantastic money uh, was raised. And she said, this is Give 30, she said, is beyond money. She said, it's phenomenal what it's doing in terms of human interactions across any barriers and boundaries. And I liked her line. She said, when good people with good hearts come together, good things are going to happen. That's Kate Brenner at uh, Winnipeg Harvest. So I might put that on future branding, Kate, uh, because that's really the spin-off benefit of what Gift 30 is all about, it's uniting people in common cause to fight a common problem that faces everyone. Um, and really, that I've heard that story and those sentiments over and over across country, which is phenomenal from all sorts of people, uh, whatever their religious background is, or if they're of no faith as well. So this is now a, a contribution to Canadian Ramadan culture, for want of a better description. I, I don't know how else to put this, because if uh, Ramadan comes and there's no such thing as Give 30, now we've lost something. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's overnight it's become something like this, that people know about it. I mean, my first year, I, I, I'd be always, you know, at every iftar I'd be shilling, you know, give 30. But now people are telling me about it. I don't have to explain it anymore. I was at iftar the other uh, night and someone heard about it and just wanted more details and wanted, and they got out the laptop and started donating right there uh, at the dinner table. So it's, you know, you're right. It has a brand value and it's known. Um, so, yes, I would like to think it's become sort of an institutional thing that's part of Canadian Ramadan. Uh, it's a very Canadian thing as well. I had a U.S. Uh, uh, news magazine at the University of Michigan that writes about interfaith interactions. Uh, you know, and the, r the person who wrote that story, one of his first sentences was, uh, you know, Americans think they're, uh, they're the innovators of great grassroots campaigns, and this time Canadians are teaching us something which I liked because, I mean, I have a lot of admiration for Americans and their outgoing spirit. And that's really what it is, is taking a small idea and just saying, I don't care what the odds are. It's very American, you know, Canadians are kind of a little more restrained. But take that and just go with it. Uh, there's a the guy who, who teaches, Ken Wyman, I believe is his name, teaches at Humber College fundraising. That's his business. Huge Twitter follow. Like last year, he tweeted, Canadians start new Ramadan fundraising tradition. His tweet made it to the UK, uh, and fundraising professionals there were retweeting it. So I think there is, there may have been a need for this or a vacuum. I don't know what it is, but it seems to be catching on. Um, we're into the third year now, and before, the fir in the first year it was a city. Then it became a region with a few other cities. 
and now it's truly national. Truly national. Um, you can update us or yeah. share with us how that came about and yeah. how is it going this, this year, 20, 21 days into this. Yeah. So started with Daily Bread Food Bank, largest food bank in Toronto, and Daily Bread's great. That was a great partner to have. That was my first partner. Then we spread to four, Alberta, Quebec, and Ontario. That's where my partners were. This year, it's gone completely national. 11 partners, the largest food banks in the country, from Vancouver all the way to Quebec. There's partners in every province, six provinces, four time zones, I like to say. It's hard to manage your social media when you're four time zones. Uh, but it's a continent-sized country, so you're managing it across, uh, across the continent, uh, which is phenomenal and a great experience. A lot, you know, this year we're already, today we're at $60,000. I have a donor who's going to be giving a lot more money next week, so we'll be at 70000 at least next week. Um, you know, my Winnipeg partner uh, wants it to be 150 is our goal this year. So gets, I'd love to have that, but it's a bit of a stretch. But if we hit 100 this year, I mean, we will, in the three years that this little homemade campaign has become a national campaign, we will have raised close to a quarter of a million dollars. And I know when people are spending a billion dollars on weapons or useless junk, $250,000 doesn't sound a lot. But if you think about the smallness of means that we have, which is basically a website, two social media accounts, and a lot of volunteers that are just pushing the message, that's pretty phenomenal. Now, that $250,000 is not 250000 normal dollars that the rest of us uh, you know, earn, spend. Um, there's a multiplier effect. There's, there's, there's some increase, some baraka, uh, as the Quran word is, it, the increase. Um, can you touch upon that? Any dollar you give to the food bank, I mean, I encourage people to obviously when there's a food drive at a mosque or a church or at the supermarket or wherever your community center, you should give to that. The problem though is you're lugging food, there's logistics issues, and you don't know what the food bank really needs at that time. Uh, you know, they may need different things, baby food or peanut butter or something. Um, and you may be giving them something totally different. So what, uh, what I like to do with the money is it's fungible as they say and uh, you know it works everywhere and the food banks can take that money and leverage it because they have partnerships with grocery suppliers Campbell Soup is just across the street here from Daily Bread and they just delivered a lot of food to Daily Bread for the summer um, that one dollar can become five ten or twelve dollars leveraged uh, in terms of what they can buy so if someone because they've saved you know say your your lunch and coffee money was ten dollars a day and you gave three hundred you know, that's the gift 30 for 30 days times the ten dollars. So say we gave, th I'd give thir 300 bucks to give 30. Imagine that you'd leverage that five or ten times and that's the impact of what you're giving. So don't think what you're giving is small because every dollar matters and then it's going to get amplified when it gets into the food bank system. So there was a young man who gave uh, a little bit of money last year and he's giving money again this year? Yeah, Simon Lee. He's He's nine now, he was eight years old last year. Again, power of uh, Matt Galloway. <laughs> His mother heard me on that show last year. Uh, she wanted to give, uh, and he wanted to give $5 because he asked her what she was doing. And his little uh, friends next door were Muslim and they were fasting, so it was a solidarity thing. Uh, his donation initially was rejected. His mom wanted to put it online because Daily Bread only has a $10 threshold for online donations. So he was upset and she contacted me, but I talked to her and I said, look, why don't we turn this into a positive story, bring him to the food bank, we'll have the tour, he can deliver his $5. People can go to the Give30 Facebook page, it's uh, facebook.com slash give30, uh, and tonight it'll be posted there, but it's on, on, on the site. The pictures from last year's tour, when Simon and his brother Colin came and delivered their money, was phenomenal. Uh, that encouraged other people to give. So I talked to Catherine, his mother, this year. She's a big supporter and will continue supporting us. Simon is an ambassador for life for Give30. Uh, she was very proud of him this year because she said for three reasons, she said. He won an academic award at school. He won a character award she was very, very proud of. And he's a Give30 ambassador. That was the third thing she was very proud of him about. And she said, you know what? He's decided to double his donation to $10. And I thought, you know what? It's all relative, you know? Uh, to Simon, that's probably a lot, lot or most of the money he has. But look at the generosity of that. 
And that really reflects in Islam, there's a hadith about giving what you can give. Even if you had a few dates or something, if you give all of that or most of that, uh, it's the significance to you of what you're giving. So I'm challenging people to match what Simon's doing. Up your game, you know. Uh, think about how much money we spend on coffee. I might spend five bucks on coffee. And the average food bank user has five dollars a day to live on. Transit, food, everything after they pay their rent. So we may be disposing of five bucks robotically, but it means a lot more. So up your game, yeah, make a little sacrifice. That's what Ramadan's about. Give up a couple more things and uh, increase your donation. It may have a huge effect to the food banks. And you'll be building Give30. As I said, these other spin-off benefits in human relations are taking place. The more successful this campaign becomes, the more you're going to be also contributing to that impact. Um, we're into the last 10 days of Ramadan, and Muslims focus on spirituality. Um, you're going to be focusing on running around and, and following up and, and answering. Um, what are your last 10 days? What is the last 10 days of the Give 30 going to look like? Uh, you know what? We are. I, I am busy like a beaver <laughs> uh, on the Give 30 during Ramadan, especially. You know, people are probably sick of my posts, but I post a lot of things. Some of it fun, some of it serious, some of it informative. Uh, but I will be amping it up. Uh, I will try to take some time for myself during, uh, you know, Ramadan, obviously, uh, but it's been so busy this year, and especially during the last 10 days. I'm going to try to squeeze a bit of time for myself, but I also know that, you know, work needs to be done in the world. There are people that are hungry. So if I can encourage people in this time of super generosity to just give a little bit more to, to help those in need, our neighbors, you know, the Prophet said that we ought to help our neighbors. Uh, and in his time, he... For him, he said it was 40 doors. If you think about it, it's, it's not 40 doors, it's context. He was telling people in his small community of Mecca, it's 40 doors seemed like a lot probably then. We live in a global community. Our neighbors are people all across this country, in this city. Uh, our neighbors are around the world. So we need to, regardless of who those neighbors are, think about them and try to reach out to help. Give 30 is not the only way to help, it's one way. I think it has, as we've talked about, some phenomenal, phenomenal uh, positive impacts. Uh, so by investing in Give 30, by donating, you're helping those people who don't have enough to eat, but you're also helping to build this movement even further so that, inshallah, by next year, whether I'm alive or not, this thing will continue without me. It does not have to depend on me. Um. There still might be a few people out there who are, who are, who are like, okay, I, I listened to the video and whatever, just uh, uh, explain this to me like a four-year-old. Uh, what is Give 30? Okay, so in a nutshell, the 30 is the 30 days of Ramadan. I will not debate 29 or 30 days, but it's 30 days of Ramadan. You're saving money for those 30 days by not eating during daylight hours. 30, tally up your savings. So everybody do your own little calculation. Uh, you know, how much you'd spend on lunch, coffee, all of that. Put that in one column, multiply by 30, there you go, that's the amount you're giving. Uh, so it means something to you. And if you're not fasting for whatever reason, or if you're not even Muslim participating in the fasting, you can participate in the spirit of Ramadan. Bring your lunch to work. That spread between food court and homemade lunch is huge, right? Because people spend about average eight to ten dollars a day on lunch. If you bring your leftovers, leftover pizza slice is going to cost you a buck use that as a calculation. Or give up the coffee for the whole month. If you really can't give up the coffee, then value that coffee. Every time you buy that coffee every day, notionally buy one for Give30 uh, and multiply that by 30. So match, exactly. matching funds. Match, exactly. So it's not necessarily... I need to get Tim Hortons to be my sponsor, but they probably hate me for getting the coffee. Well, uh, it's so it's not necessarily give a dollar a day, give $30. That's it's right. give something of value, value for, the, 30 for the equivalent of 30 days Correct. of what it means to you. Correct. So for some people like Simon, it was $5 for $10 for the course of 30 days. Correct. And for others, it's, it's many, many more than that. If you are blessed with wealth and you can afford $1,000 a day, give $30,000. If you can give $30, give $30. But give something. Uh, the beauty of this is I have donors giving $10,000. And I have donors who like give me ten dollars, but you know what? It's what he can afford, what Simon, and what it means to him, where that motivation is coming from. So 
So I'm asking everyone to do, everybody can do something. So I'm asking people to just find that what, what they're willing to do uh, because they're going to be addressing hunger in this country. And again, they're going to be joining a movement. Get on that Facebook page and like it. Uh, follow on Twitter if you're on Twitter. But the other thing I'm trying to do is build a movement around understanding hunger. This is one of the wealthiest countries on the world. It is completely absurd that we have people that are hungry. That's because of politicians who won't enact proper policies uh, on affordable housing, transit, uh, minimum wage, uh, sustainable income. They would just won't do that for all these sorts of reasons. But we need to build a community and a constituency that will start to then think about how we mobilize each other to push for changes so that we don't need Give30, we don't need food banks, everyone is well fed in Canada, and then we can think about resolving poverty issues even in other countries, our other neighbors that are further, more than 40 doors away. Well, there comes a point in every interview where you just have to know when to stop, and that's the point that I know there's nothing really else to say. Good. So, Brother Ziad, uh, thank you for making the time on this third Juma of Ramadan 2014 to meet me here in South Etobicoke. And uh, inshallah, you know, when people see this, there will be some benefit. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we were able to meet this year uh, on less rushed terms. My uh, pleasure. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak.